Welcome to Mechanics Hall. Um, we are uh, pleased uh, to offer our Maker Series, and our first uh, uh, maker is Paul Farrell, who's somebody that uh, I've known for many years and who's a good friend of my wife's. And uh, when we were thinking about this in terms of makers, this was uh, uh, Paul's name came to mind, and here he is, and he can tell you a story about Union Bagel Company. Paul? Hello. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, really honored to be here and a little bit nervous. And I was telling my wife I was a little bit nervous, and she said, ah, don't be worried about it. You're going to be talking about your favorite subject yourself. So, <laughs> she made me laugh. And then she asked me what I was going to wear, and it all went to. <laughs> but um, I, am, I am actually very flattered to be here. And, uh, you know, I, it's true in some ways that I do like talking about what I do and where I've come from. Um, not so much because uh, I like to talk about myself, but because I'm, I'm truly in awe of where I am in my life right now. And um, to, to understand that or to explain that a little more clearly, I'm going to give you a little bit of my background, where I come from and, and how I got to where I am right now. Um, I'm the grandson of four immigrants. Uh, two were Catholics from Northern Ireland, and my mother's parents were Jews from Poland. So they all came to this country to escape whatever it was that was going on over there that I have some understanding of, but really only can imagine the kind of things that they went through. Um, my grandmother, I remember on my mother's side telling several stories that I think about regularly. So that had a lot to do with influence in where I went, well, later on in my life, it influenced where I, I wanted to go and sort of honoring what they came here to, to accomplish. My parents grew up the children of immigrants, um, went to public schools, and became quite successful. My father was a journalist, and my mother became a school teacher in New York City. So I grew up in a fairly comfortable middle class um, environment, you know. Um, we got to travel a bit. My father was assigned to a number of different places, including Israel. So we got to live overseas. I got to have some experiences that a lot of people my age at that time didn't get to have. When we moved back to America um, in, I think it was 79 or 80, um, we, uh, we, we, moved in, we moved to Brooklyn, New York. And it was a very different environment from the one that I had just spent the previous three years living in, uh, which was Jerusalem. And that was Jerusalem in the mid-70s, which was a pretty interesting time. So um, while I don't think I ever fully comprehended, you know, the, the danger, so to speak, that existed, there was that danger there. And there were certain things, precautions that you had to take. And there was a certain style to the way people lived that, you know, that being a part of the daily life um, made things just a little bit more exciting. You could, you just took more chances. You did more things. It was less insulated. It wasn't safe the way, in many ways, the way it is here, or at least the life that I came back to was. Um, so I moved to Brooklyn, Maine, and it's, you know, I mean, Brooklyn, <laughs> Brooklyn, New York. I ended up in Brooklyn, Maine, but that was many years later. Um, and I'll get to that hopefully not too long. But uh, so we end up in Brooklyn, New York, and um, I just felt like a fish out of water. And then um, I had a really difficult time adjusting to being back in the United States, uh, to being, you know, trying to, to reintegrate into society, <laughs> so to speak. Um, during that time, I, um, my parents started to not get along so well, um, and my father left. And so things at home started to fall apart, and I started to act out. I started to just try to figure out where my place was in the world. So here I am. I'm in this, this, this city that I don't really like. Uh, I'm in a school that I don't like. I'm doing my best to make things work, and it's just not coming together. And, and finally, one day, I, I, I quit school. I, I was at the corner and I went up to the high school, I was going in and I just decided that I wasn't going to do it anymore. And um, I was no stranger to playing hooky, um, but I still did pretty well in school despite that. And uh, I had a, several friends that were no strangers to playing hooky and um, a couple of them had decided that, you know, the, the track they needed to take was to, you know, be done with school and go to work. So um, I, I joined a, a friend of mine and we went down and I found a job that day. And uh, I started a long career of of no real career, just, you know, endless jobs, um, this constant search for, you know, what am I doing? What does it mean to, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to, you know, 
uh, be successful. Like, uh, what the hell am I doing in my life, you know? And uh, where's this all going? You know, should I be in school? Should I not? You know, it's like, <clears throat> um, so I was bouncing around from job to job, <clears throat> trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, I made a couple of, I, I got my GED and I took the SATs and I made an attempt at uh, college and I went for a very brief time. Um, and thinking back, it was, it was pretty obvious what I was doing. I, was, uh, I went to a, a small school in Long Island um, and uh, I can't really remember, I can't remember the name of the school, but it was this small little school and uh, I told myself I was going to be a biology major and this place was very close to the beach and I think I went to class three or four times <laughs> and uh, I spent a lot of time at the beach in the winter too I mean it didn't matter there was a group of us that went out there and we had a great time um, I had a very good time um, I don't remember all of it but most of it I do <laughs> and uh, and that was my that was my first go at college I was I was proud to be it's silly to say now but at the time I was very proud to be part of the 25 percent that had a straight zero average and uh, <laughs> and was on instant academic probation. Um, so I decided that like, all right, I'm gonna get it together and try to take this a little more seriously. I, I, I do have some interests that I'd like to follow up on. Um, and that Christmas, uh, my father came home and he, he was sick, he was dying of cancer. So I decided that I was gonna stay uh, and be with him um, and you know help out as best I could um, and, and just be with the family and try to salvage what I could of my relationship with my father. And uh, we tried, you know, and I look back on it now, it was not a great time, but I look back on it now and I'm so grateful that I, that I made that, that attempt. And I know that he tried too, and there's, there's some solace in that. It's taken me a long time to, to get to a place where I understand that, but I'm finally at that place. I'm fortunate that I've, I've lived long enough to, you know, and I'm not that old, but you know, I've lived long enough to, to get to that place. Um, and that ties directly into uh, something that happened about 12 years after he died, which was um, I got sober. And that does eventually lead to <laughs> me opening a bagel shop, I promise. <laughs> um, but during that time, during that 11 or 12 years, I, I, you know, I continued my search for, for meaning. Um, I, I went down, I went to, I tried college again, I went to Buffalo. Um, I went to state college up there, lasted about a year and a half, did actually manage to get some grades up there. Um, I did go to classes. The classes that interested me were not the ones that were ever really going to um, add up to anything, so to speak, um, other than my own. They answered some of the own, my questions inside, or at least they, they actually, better than that, they, they caused me to ask more questions, and they caused me to just look at the world in different ways. Uh, those classes were, you know, one was a history of Vietnam class. One was taught by a guy who was a radical leftist at the time uh, of the Vietnam War and uh, was a protester and was involved with the weathermen and all this stuff. A lot of stuff he would hint at and not talk about because I don't know if he was being dramatic or not, but it definitely had an effect on me, and it was a great class. So I learned a lot, and I learned to think outside of what I had been taught, which was, um, you know, my mother's a, a leftist liberal, and, um, and so she had a very fixed perspective on things, and I was really looking for a different way of looking at things. And even though this guy was a radical left instructor, he still made me look at things differently and see other things. Other classes that I did well in were design classes. Uh, I did really well in a sculpture class. I took a couple of sculpture classes. I did well in those. So that kind of thing. So anything that, was, that would challenge me um, intellectually, uh, cause me to question, cause me to, to basically keep going in a direction that didn't seem to have a direction, um, and anything that might be creative, you know, uh, sort of fed some things inside of me that that I couldn't seem to find anywhere else. And uh, from Buffalo, you know, I, I lasted about a year and a half, two years. Um, and then, uh, oh, just a quick side note, while I was in Buffalo, I did play rugby for a few weeks and because uh, I thought I'd, it would help me get in touch with the Irish side of my family. Um, and I just ended up getting beat up and bruised pretty hard. And <laughs> I didn't last very long as a rugby player, but um, Anyway, so from, from Buffalo, I went down to Key West, just messed around down there. But uh, what was important about that was that um, I, I worked in a kitchen. I got a job. I went down there to work for my uncle um, who was doing a clothing store. And 
I, I went to work for him. It didn't last very long. I found myself out of work. I found myself wondering, you know, once again and in the middle of many more to come, you know, where, where was I? What was I doing? Where was I going? What was I going to, what was this all about? You know, just still like that search, still looking. Um, and I ended up working in a kitchen. I, throughout my work life, I've often ended up in kitchens, whether it's washing dishes or doing prep. Um, in this particular kitchen, I ended up running his kitchen for him. This guy was, uh, he was an accomplished chef from Chicago, and he had moved down to Key West to open his own place. And um, he had this little, it was just a little pasta place, and we had a very simple menu. And uh, I learned a lot from that guy. It was a small kitchen. Um, I was walking by one day and I was, you know, just gotten off the phone with my brother. It's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I'm coming home. You know, home was still Brooklyn, my mother's home. Um, and I walked by this shop. I see the guy working. I go in. I was like, hey, do you know if they're hiring? And he said no. And I said, like, you know, I, I copped an attitude with the guy. I'm like, what do you mean no? Like, you know you don't know or no, they're not hiring? Turns out he was the owner and he's like, well, I wasn't hiring, but, you know, since you're giving me a ration of shit here. Um, <laughs> Let's talk. So um, he didn't make any promises, but I, I got to help him build out a shop and we got to know each other a little bit. And, um, and he showed me some things in the kitchen. Again, he had a, he had a very simple menu um, and it was a very small kitchen. It was Key West and it got really hot in there, but I, I loved it. I felt very much like I'd found something that I could, I could, I could connect with. Um, and I like this guy's way of doing things. It was, it was outside of the, it was outside of what, you know, I perceived to be the norm. It was, he was kind of doing it in his own style. Um, he, you know, there's certain rules you got to play by, but he wasn't, it wasn't a big fancy place. He wasn't trying to impress anybody. He just had a, he just had a lot of confidence in the food that he was doing. And he was very passionate about the food he was doing. He liked it and he loved it. And it was the same menu every day and, and people came. You know, from the very beginning, people were coming in and we got busier and busier. Um, and I ended up running his kitchen and I was not a young man of much confidence, you know, um, but I found confidence in that kitchen. I found confidence cooking and taking orders. And, you know, sometimes I was I took it too far, you know. And uh, but what I discovered was that, like, you know, at the end of the night, I could be like, hey, you know, it, it would all come together. If I if I got wound up or if some of the wait staff got wound up, it was it was just in the moment, you know, and that's, it was a dysfunction that I understood. It was a dysfunction that I operated well with and within. And um, I think it's a big part of why a lot of people work in restaurants is, you know, there's, there's a lot of that. And that's a whole other lecture for somebody else that has a better understanding of it. But, um, you know, and it was there that I, I started thinking about, you know, I was 25 years old. I started thinking about like, all right, here's something I'm actually decent at. Here's something that I actually like. I've held this job for more than six weeks. Um, maybe this is something I could be good at, you know? And this guy was an accomplished chef and he came from Chicago and he knew a lot of people. And so we started talking and I started asking him about, you know, culinary schools and thinking about making a career out of being a chef and what does that take? And, you know, he gave me some advice and I started thinking about things. And then I started talking to um, some of the wait staff that worked there and it turns out they had gone down to Key West from Maine. Um, these were women that I worked with. Their boyfriends and husbands had gone to the school called the Landing School in Kennebunk, um, where they'd learned how to build boats and that kind of thing. So I immediately shifted, which is pretty typical of often of how I do things uh, or have done things. <laughs> I try to do it less this way now. But um, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a chef. You know, that's the way to go, culinary, you know. And, and then these guys talked about boat school, and I thought, that's it. You know, it's like, boom, I'm going to boat school. <laughs> And, uh, you know, part of it was like when I was looking at, um, when I was looking at, at uh, what's entailed in the life of a chef, um, it's, 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 it's rough life. It's, you know, there's, there's a lot of personal satisfaction from it. And, and I see that and I often envy, uh, you know, people that have been able to pursue that life and have accomplished things. And they do these amazing things and, you know, they have these amazing skills. But for me, it was like, I knew that eventually that kind of that kind of drama, those kinds of late hours, um, the kind of boozing that I was already doing, and that you know was, that I was looking at coming down the pike, um, in that lifestyle, that like I, I wasn't going to make it. And that wasn't a cognizant thought; it was more of an intuition that 
was more a suspicion because I wasn't a very clear-headed person at that time. Um, but I, so I thought, all right, that's what I'm going to do. And um, I was living with my college girlfriend at the time. She left and went back to Buffalo to finish up school because, you know, Key West was fun for a little while when you're coming from Buffalo, but eventually it gets, it gets old. Um, it's a very tran transient life. It's very, it's Key West, man. And it was Key West in the 80s, so there was, it was, there was a lot of things down there that I needed to get away from. So I came back to New York and uh, applied for the school, spent a year as a, a van messenger, and then, um, and then came to Maine to go to boat school. Uh, I spent two years at the landing school, which were, were they were an amazing two years. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I, when I'd gone to college, just to backtrack for a moment, when I'd gone to college, I thought maybe I, I, I always had an interest in architecture and building and everything, and I could never, I could never get it together. You know what I mean? It's like I could barely make it to class, let alone like, you know, really just accomplish anything in any kind of classes that demanded anything other than, you know, an argument or beating the hell out of a piece of marble. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I had the brain for it, but not the, not the, um, the, the, the discipline. Um, and that's been a constant in my life. So, um, so I went to the boat school. I wanted to do the architecture, pro the, the yacht design program. They said they didn't have any room, do the boat building. So I did the year of boat building and then I got into the, the, the yacht design. And from there I got a job at, this does eventually lead to me making bagels, I promise. <laughs> um, I ended up at a place called the Brooklyn Boatyard, um, which was uh, a, a really incredible place. And it still is to this day. And um, I met some amazing people. There was, uh, they, they still do wooden boats. They were on the uh, forefront of modern wood technology. Um, they maintained a lot of classic wooden boats. It was, it was a very romantic place to be and it, it fulfilled all my romantic notions of, you know, doing this, you know, being a craftsman and really connecting with something and, and, you know, making some of my, something in my life and being a master at something. And, uh, it didn't take me long to realize that I still lacked the, the discipline and the patience that it takes to, to do a job like that. I mean, these guys weren't just slapping fiberglass on stuff and they weren't just, you know, throwing together boats and it wasn't an assembly line. They took a lot of pride in what they did. And, you know, God bless them, man. Uh, the owner of the, that yard kept me employed for two and a half years. <laughs> I don't know if I would have kept me employed for two and a half years, but, uh, but he did, you know. And um, finally, I, I, I just decided that, you know, it, I wasn't doing him any service, and I certainly wasn't doing myself any service. Um, so I went back to uh, I went back to kitchens. I got a job. Um, there was a local inn up there, and I got a job in that kitchen. And um, I uh, it was 1996. It was the winter, and um, I'd been working there for a few months. And I had you know the epiphany that people have, and I decided you know I realized that it was it was time to sober up, and so I got sober and. That's really important because it was at that time that I sort of stopped sabotaging my life, where I started to learn how to stop sabotaging my life. Um, I still wrestle with a lot of the things that I've always wrestled with. You know, discipline um, is a tough one for me. Staying focused is a tough one for me. Um, I've always got an idea. I always want to do the next thing, but I, I you know, you got to finish one thing before I can start another. And, you know, I've learned how to do that, but it's been over time. And so two years in, so during one of my just backtrack for a moment, during one of my uh, many sort of wanderings and stints, just picking up random work, um, I was in Vermont and I was working at a friend's, a friend of mine got me this job at, a, at an inn, that was a big cross country ski inn, it was, they had like, I don't know, 15 rooms or something, it was a manor and it was, it wasn't like super posh, but it was kind of, it was a very nice place and they had a really nice kitchen and you know, they took me on as a dishwasher and I spent six weeks up there on a winter break. Um, and I, you know, I slept in the tanning booth and I worked in the kitchen and I drank beer at night and I made a lot of friends and I had a really good time and I, you know, and I, I met my first real baker. I met this guy from New Jersey whose family had owned a bakery in New Jersey and um, he had spent his whole life trying to get away from the bakery when I met him. And here he was in this kitchen. He was really trying to become a chef. He wanted, you know, he wanted to, he was a sous chef, I think, at that time, but they, we're constantly putting him on whatever big products they needed, they needed, they would put him on. So we got to talking one day and he told me about that. And 
something rang true about that. Not something that I understood, not something that I even understood rang true until much later on, probably another 10 years or so. Um, when, uh, you know, I was, I, was in, I was in Brooklyn, Maine, and, uh, you know, two years, two years sober, and I'm trying to figure out what's coming next, and I'm driving pizzas, and I'm, you know, working for a landscaper, and I was unemployed for a while, and um, this guy who owned a pizza shop that I worked for was a friend of mine, and uh, I told him that there was this, this new bakery over at the Blue Hill Co-op, and, you know, I was like, I'd always had this sort of back-of-my-mind fantasy that maybe I could be a baker, maybe that's something that would appeal to me. And he's like, you know, you should go check that out. I'm like, well, don't you? He's like, dude, I can find a delivery driver. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not that hard to find a pizza delivery. I hate to break it to you, but you're, you're easily replaced. And, uh, and so I, I went down and I talked to this guy, Steve. It's, it's, uh, Steve Lancelotta is, is the guy who owns that bakery, and he's the fellow who taught me how to bake. And some of you might know that name. He was the baker at Macucci's for a long time and is now one of the partners in Slab. The guy is an amazing He's just amazing. Before he was a baker, he was a wood carver. Um, and I saw some of his work and it just floored me. So this guy is like what, him, what I had always fantasized about being. You know, he, he has the discipline. He has the, the, the wherewithal and he could figure out all these things. But he passed on what knowledge he could to me. And, um, and I became a baker and I, I found this. I found a place where I felt like I really fit in. Not just in a kitchen where I could be the boss. And I could, you know, put out a dish that, and, and yell at people and hit the bell too many times and just basically be a pain in the ass, you know. I, I, found, a, I found a job that I could really, like, really connect with. Um, it, became, it became a part of me. I became a part of it. I connected to it. And the way he does things is very different, you know. He, everything was mixed by hand. So even the, even the mixing of the dough became this sort of rhythmic exercise. It was, it was meditative, everything about it, you know from the very beginning, from putting the ingredients into the bowls to mixing the dough to everything that came after, to putting it in the oven. And he too had a very small space, even smaller than the kitchen I worked in in, um, in Key West. I think he, I don't believe he had more than 350 square feet, if he had that much. Um, and he was just, he knew how to set things up. He knew how to have an order to things. He knew how to just, and we put a lot of bread through a single deck pizza oven. We did a lot of bread in a short period of time, in just a few hours every day. Um, and he had a small wholesale part of it, and then people would come in all day long and just buy his bread. And, and I learned a lot from that guy. I learned how to use a short space. I, I learned how to slow down a little bit. I mean, some of it was, you know, I, I learned how to stop sabotaging everything that I tried to do, you know. Um, but um, I connected with this, you know, and, and the thing about baking for me is that, you know, I, I mean, I've eaten bread all my life. It's, you know, my brother to this day has always, has always and to this day still makes fun of me um, because I'm all about bread and cheese, man. <laughs> and pretty much, you know, it's like pizza covers it all. It's got everything I need. It's, um, but I mean, from the crappiest, roll to like the finest loaf of you know some artisan bull it's like i just love bread it's just part of who and what i am i've always connected with it i just it's where i go the thing about baking for me is that there's a little bit more of a an immediate sort of gratification for it uh to it um the the, the results are a little more direct you know i don't have to wait i don't have to put seven coats of varnish on i don't have to worry about this fine cut i mean there are there are delicacies, but it's far more forgiving than, you know, a hundred dollar piece of wood that I have to make an exact cut on that um, has too many angles and confused me. <laughs> so, um, so I learned how to bake from this guy and I uh, worked for him for a couple of years and then I started getting restless again. Um, it was, there was a number of things going on and it was just, it was just, it was time to move on and do something different. And, um, and, you know, I, I mean, he had, the, he had the artisan bread thing covered. I wasn't going to be able to compete with him, and, and I didn't want to. You know, I didn't want to I didn't want um, to try to like, steal that from him or compete with that. It's like it, it was pointless, and it, didn't, it wouldn't have felt right anyway. Um, so I, I, I went to my friend who had the pizza shop, and I said, you know, I was thinking about making bagels, and I made a few bagels at home. I miss bagels. I grew up in New York, you know, um, on and off eating bagels all, always. Um, it had become a comfort food. There were many days when, like, I would play hooky and go get a bagel and a Coke from the place down the corner, not too far from where I lived. And there were days where it just made me feel better, you know. <laughs> I don't know if it was the caffeine or what, but um, 
So I, I decided to make some bagels. You know, I made them in my kitchen at home, and I thought, wow, these are halfway decent. And nobody around here is even doing a halfway decent bagel. This is, again, down East Maine. And um, I went to my friend with the pizza shop, and he's like, sure, man, why don't you use it at night? You can come in and uh, make yourself some bagels and see what happens. And so I started doing that, and it lasted for maybe four or five months. Um, uh, but, you know, and I, I, I learned a lot. I, I went out and I tried to sell bagels. I, I sold them to the co-op. I sold them to some restaurants. I would deliver them to people's houses. But uh, Down East Maine is a very, you know, spread out place. And uh, it, it just, I didn't know what I was doing. There were a lot of reasons it didn't work out. And uh, I just, I, I finally stopped doing it. Um, packed everything up. There wasn't much to pack up at that point. Um, and, and moved down to Portland, where I went to work for a number of different bakeries, um, tried Boatyard again, did a number of different things. Um, so I, I ended up in a bar, bartending, did that for about four or five years I worked at this bar. After that I became a mortgage broker wanting to get out of the bartending life. And then just as I was trying to become a mortgage, breaker, mortgage broker, um, everything collapsed. 2008, it all went to hell. Um, and that was probably the worst career decision of my life was <laughs> trying to get into the mortgage broker business at that time. And uh, yeah, I, I failed miserably as it was as a mortgage broker, but then when everything tanked, there was, there was little hope of, of doing much. So um, I, I went back to school for a little while and, uh, and then I got a job with, yeah, I went to the community college for a little while. And, uh, and then I got a job with uh, Standard Baking. I managed to get a job with them, which was great. They're a great place to work. And I learned a lot working with them. More production, bigger place, you know, learned some things there. Um, just real quick, got an opportunity to do some political organizing. That led to uh, a, a job with the Southern Maine Workers Center. And my job with the Southern Maine Workers Center was, um, was their interfaith liaison. And as their interfaith liaison, my job was to create relationships with communities that, you know, that, um, that we were trying to connect with. Uh, so that it wasn't just, was it the, uh, the expression is rent a collar. So like whenever there's a, whenever there's a labor action of any kind, whether it's, whether it's an organized union or whether it's just a small group of people getting together, trying to, you know, stand up for something, um, they'll go to a clergy of some sort and, and ask for their support. So rather than just have that kind of a sort of like relationship, my job was to start getting to know people, connect people, let them know what, you know, what a labor organization was all about, what the Southern Maine Workers Center was about, because it was, <clears throat> it was affiliated with the, uh, with the labor unions and with the, with the labor union committee, but it was its own entity um, and it was not an organized union. So it was through them that I, I started to make these connections and um, I started to develop this, this idea that, um, and this is where the bagels start to come back to life for me. Um, you know, one of the things I realized when, when, when the housing collapse came and when we went into this big recession um, and everybody was, was so interconnected at such a high level, we, we've basically all been drawn in. Again, this is just my way of, this is my way of seeing things, but it, we were all drawn into this, this, this big picture thing. You know, where we, in order to start a business, you have to, you have to have a loan and you have to, you know, you have to have a connection with a bank and you have to go through all these hoops and jump through all these things. And, um, that's that to me, that seemed like, uh, it seemed like it, it just, it just didn't seem right. It didn't seem like it was going to work. Like how does a guy like me who has, you know, the longest job I've ever held is at a bar. Um, I don't have any money in the bank to show for, you know, to really speak of. Um, don't have a great credit score, don't have a great work history. Uh, although I have a, I've worked all my life, I don't have a solid career or anything like that. How does a guy like me get into business? How does a guy like me do something like this, you know? And I thought about all the things I'd learned from, from um, the, the pasta shop that I worked in in Key West, from the baker that I worked for in Blue Hill, and uh, you know, thinking about how, how did people do it when they first came to this country and there were no services, there was no, nothing. Like you got here and you made it work or you, you didn't last. And um, you know, I started thinking about my grandparents and I started to develop this idea that I don't need them. I don't need the, uh, it's not, there's gotta be another way, you know? Um, and I, I started 
develop, you know, sort of reinforcing these these ideas that I had of 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 um, you know uh, that there was a, just that there was another way of doing things. So one of the things I learned when I was in school, I was introduced to this company called Mondragon. So I've got this sort of socialist bent, I guess you would call it. Um, although I do consider myself very much to be a capitalist, and I'm always trying to figure out if those two can can mesh and balance. Uh, I, I believe they can. It's part of why I do what I do. I want it to. We'll see. You know, I'm <laughs> still, the company's only three years old and we'll see what happens. But um, this, com this, this company in Spain was started by this priest after the Spanish Civil War, um, basically because the, the Basque region of Spain was just demolished and people didn't have work. And he literally stood on the corner, begged and collected enough money to start the school. The school turned into uh, a company that made things, and from there it's just grown. It's now this huge corporation, and it's a completely cooperative corporation. It's one of the biggest corporations in the world, and it's totally cooperative. So they have this incredibly involved and intricate democratic system and democratic way of running their, their business, you know. And, and for a lot of, a lot of people, it's, it's this sort of utopia, you know. And what I've discovered is that in America, utopias don't really work. And that's that's all right. It's just the reality of how we how we think and how we are, and um, you know, there's, it's just how we are. So, 2012, I'd gone back to school. I found myself unemployed again for a while. I went back to. I'm very close to finishing a degree, but I'm still a few credits away. I'm still a few classes away. Um, went back to school for a while. A friend of mine's like. You know, I'm like, what am I going to do when, when school is done? You know, what am I going to do with this degree? I'm, I'm 47, 48 years old. Who's going to hire a 48-year-old with a brand new bachelor's degree in economics? And, you know, it's not that impressive a degree, really, because um, I'm not a very impressive economist. It's like one of the things that I discovered studying economics is that a lot of it is just, you know, if you remove reality, then this theory will apply, and it works. That's just how I see it. But I haven't... I haven't really found anybody that can show me otherwise. So all these things I'm studying, I just, I just get flustered with and frustrated with. And I start to develop this idea that like maybe I can start a cooperative company here. Maybe there's, there's some merit, some variation, some American version of what they're doing in Spain, and maybe that can grow. Um, so I recruited uh, some people that I worked with at Standard, um, and they helped me get this thing started. And then you know, what we have now that we didn't have a few years ago is Kickstarter. And that's been an incredible thing. I think Kickstarter has been one of the most advantageous uh, things. It, it got me started. Um, and I know it's gotten a lot of other people started. So we, we put together this Kickstarter campaign. We figured out what we were going to need. I found a place that we, we started in the uh, basement of the community kitchen uh, right over here at the Pu Portland Public Market. Um, I'd heard about it. It had kind of fallen they sort of shut down. It hadn't really done much in about a year. We went and approached them. They said, yeah, we'd love to see it come back to life. Worked with them a little bit, got the kitchen up and going. And then um, I moved in with these guys. And we, the plan was I would go out and sell bagels. We would make bagels every night. And um, we would build this wholesale bagel company. And it didn't quite work out the way I thought it was going to work out. Um, I. You know, we got our we got our Kickstarter funding. Um, we we bought the equipment we needed. We got things set up, and then um, these guys all had regular jobs. Uh, I, this was it for me. I didn't have a whole lot of money back in me anymore. Everything has gone into this. Um, they had other lives. It, we sort of went our own way. So it ended up being my own, just myself primarily, um, and I managed to keep it going for about six months. The, the thing is, is that I couldn't, I couldn't really get out and sell and make bagels every night. So I was never able to grow past what I had already established. Um, and then I, I finally came to a point where I realized like it was just, it wasn't working. And it was a really tough decision for me to make, but it wasn't even one that I had to make. It was more something I had to accept, which is that like it wasn't working. <laughs> I, had to, I had to shut it down. I had to, uh, I had to pack it up and hope for the best and you know, do it as honorably as I could and pay off what I accumulated a small amount of debt, nothing huge, um, but it was time to go back into the work world. So a friend of mine drove a cab. <clears throat> I talked to him about driving taxi. He's like, you know, it's pretty, pretty low barrier to entry. I'm real good at low barrier entry jobs. <laughs> 
dishwashing, you know, driving a taxi, which is not to say that there aren't skills in those jobs, because there are. Um, there, and I think, you know, I, I, it, I get on a high horse sometimes about how, like, you know, people don't fully understand that, like, those are important jobs, you know? The dishwasher is a, and I've been a dishwasher many times, dishwasher is a very pivotal part of a well-functioning kitchen. You know, a, a good taxi driver, I was an okay taxi driver, I didn't do it for that long, but um, a good taxi driver will get you where you wanna go and make, you know, just make you feel like you had a great experience, you know, and, uh, and it's an important job. Their job is to get you from A to B safely, their job is to get you there promptly, and uh, they put up with a lot, you know, and it's, um, it's an honorable profession. And I was, I was thrilled to have, have the opportunity to just at least get my, my, my feet wet in terms of doing that. And it, it provided me with a decent living. And I really thought I was what I was going to be doing for a while. And um, I started settling into it. Um, and, and, you know, it was, you know, I could have a life. I could make a decent living. I could start planning. I could start working on some things. I met the woman who eventually became my wife. And uh, life was good, you know. I'd, I'd be out driving my cab, and she'd call me up, and I'd go over, and she'd feed me dinner, and I'd go back to work driving my taxi. And I was really enjoying things, you know. I'd given it my best, and it's like I had all my stuff in storage, and I was still holding out hope, but I wasn't, I was like, I was in a really good place. Um, I, you know, it's like I've learned that when things don't work out, they're not necessarily failures. They're just, they just didn't work out. Um, and so I've had a lot of those. <laughs> and maybe it's just I don't want to call them failures anymore, you know. But um, they, what I've discovered is that if I, if I don't make them failures, they just become lessons. And those lessons become really valuable. And, um, you know, so I'm driving this taxi, and a friend of mine gets in touch with me and says that, uh, Katie Maid is moving. Katie Maid Bakery is the um, they're great ladies, and I met them when I was working at the bar. They would come in every Sunday. Sunday was my favorite night to work at Brian Brews, and there was you know you got the music in the afternoon, and then Sunday evening it was all restaurant people. So it was super low key, really easy going, just you know not never a headache, man. It was always a great night, and I made some friends that way. And Katie and Jen Caprone were were two people that, you know, I'd become friendly with. And Katie Made Bakery is at 147 Cumberland, and then they moved. They're now at 188 Congress, and I highly recommend them if you ever get a chance. If you haven't already tried them, definitely get up there and check them out. They're great ladies, and they do a great job at what they do. But <clears throat> a friend of mine called me and said they were moving out of this spot. <clears throat> the spot is on Cumberland and Smith, and I figured, well, that's great. It's a perfect little spot, you know. It's, um, so I just started showing up. <laughs> I was like, hey, you know, I heard you guys are leaving. And, Try not to sound too, you know, it's like, I didn't want to sound too much of a, I can't think of the word, but I, I you know, it's like, I, I was interested in the space. And um, they put me in touch with their, with their landlord and, and, you know, the rent was cheap enough to where I figured I could give it a shot. So um, a friend of mine who had helped me out a few times when I was at the Portland market, he did some deliveries for me. He just basically relieved me on a few occasions so that I could get some sleep. Um, had expressed an interest in teaming up with me if we'd ever, uh, if the opportunity ever presented itself. And he wanted to get in on it, on it with me when I, was, when I was at the market, but I just, I knew that, that, that the timing wasn't good, that it was just going to be a, an exercise in futility. I couldn't, I just knew it wasn't going to work. But when this spot opened up, I called him and I said, you know, the spot is opening up, are you still interested? And uh, he was, and he quit a really good job that he had. Uh, it was a good corporate job, solid benefits, pay vacations, good salary, all that stuff. It was killing him. He hated it. And uh, he came and opened up this bagel shop with me. <clears throat> and, um, and we started, you know, and it, when we started, it was, it, was, it was Toby and myself and my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and, um, and his wife, and it was just the four of us. And uh, those guys would man the counters, and Toby and I would would make bagels and bake bagels and take turns opening up every morning and in the beginning it was both of us at four o'clock in the morning of pulling up the shutters and then we realized like you really don't need two of us here so one of us could come in at six and the other one could come in at four and we took turns doing that and um we really expected it to be wholesale we weren't 
we didn't expect it was going to be a retail, uh, a retail endeavor. We didn't set up for retail. We set up to do wholesale. The, the original plan was really like, I was going to make bagels. He was going to go out and sell them. He was going to find us customers. And all we ever did was, uh, for advertising, was put a, we flipped a pizza box around and wrote, coming soon, Union Bagel. And we put that in the window and then covered the rest of the window with paper so nobody could see what was going on in there. Although the door was open all the time. And, uh, and that was it. And then our first day, we got slammed. We had no idea that people were going to actually show up. We opened up uh, the Friday of Memorial Day weekend, 2012. We opened that store. And um, we didn't know what to expect. And we got our asses handed to us. And it was great. And you know, <laughs> I think back on that day, and it was, I, I remember the floor more than anything else. It just, it was so overwhelming and exciting and chaotic and frustrating and everything else, but I just remember the floor was like an absolute mess. All I could think is like, we gotta mop this floor. And there was people like, where are my bagels? Where are my bagels? And it was great, you know? And, um, you know, so there was, <clears throat> so we had that. And, um, but, but something that's always important for me to remember is that, you know, we were, so I, I had taken all my stuff out of the, out of the storage and we, we got the place set up, but, <clears throat> It wasn't just me, and it wasn't just Toby. <clears throat> this isn't like just my success. I mean, my intent was always that it, you know, I'm still always looking for something. I'm still looking for, for, for a home of sorts. You know, I want to fit in in the bigger picture. I want to make a difference in the world. And there's not a lot I can do about most things in this life <clears throat> that trouble me. But one thing I can do is, is I can make bagels. And I can, you know, I can be a part of my community. And, you know, that, that becomes that runs the risk of becoming a hackneyed expression. Um, but it really isn't. It's really important. It's really important to me. And, and you know, the, the beautiful thing about where my shop is is that it's in a neighborhood that's, it's changing. The neighborhood's definitely changing. It was changing when I moved into it, but it's still a very lively neighborhood. There's still a lot of, um, it's still a very mixed neighborhood. There's still a lot of different, you know, people and, and, and it just, when we first moved in, there was, a, there was a cop on the corner every day, every morning, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon. That's not true so much anymore, um, but I always liked that kind of edge. You know, there was, there was life in the neighborhood, and there's still life in the neighborhood, and every morning all the kids gather around in front of the, in front of the shop to get on the school bus, and half of them come inside to keep warm. This winter, it wasn't as bad as, not bad, but I mean, it didn't happen as much as last winter. Last winter, they'd literally all just crowd in and just stand there and not look at us and just try to keep warm. You know, we'd like, hey, what's going on, kids? And like, mm, you know, they're 12-year-old kids, man, or last year was high school kids. But <clears throat> so that's really important to me, and that's really important. And it was important to Toby, too. It was important to both of us, and it was something that, you know, it's still something important, and I don't want to lose that. You know, it, it, it needs to be, regardless of where I go from here, it needs to be a part of, of how I proceed. And, um, and I say how, but it's uh, me, but it's not, it's partially me, but I, I always feel like I, I try to remember that it's we. It's the people that work for me that are really important because like, I'm, I'm nothing without these guys. I got a great crew that works with me. And uh, they care about what we do. They, they, they buy into what we do. Um, they're, they're invested, you know, they come in and they do their job. You know, it's not just, it's not just, ah, I'm just throwing bagels over the counter. It's like, it matters. It matters because any job matters. Anything we do matters. And that's important to me, you know. That shop got set up because um, so many people kicked in and, and helped out. It wasn't, you know, it's like, I didn't have money to hire contractors. I didn't have money to, um, to get a designer or an architect in or any of that kind of thing. It's like, people came and helped. Uh, a good friend of mine's an electrician. People, friends of ours came to help paint. Um, that kind of thing. People spreading the word, you know, giving us reviews on Yelp and, and Google and that kind of thing. Um, so it can be done, you know, and it, it, it's done by it not being about me. It's done by it being about those around me and wanting to be a part of something, you know. And I was, I was joking around with some friends of mine the other day and talking about how the neighborhood's changed. And, you know, I mean, I literally... Like, I've served billionaires, and I've served people with, like, you know, literally empty in their pockets for change to try to pay for the coffee. And uh, I take a lot of pride in that. You know, I've had political candidates walk through my door. I've had, you know, all the whole spectrum, the full spectrum. And that's the beauty of food, and that's what I think I've always connected about or connected with when it comes to food is that 
it covers the spectrum, you know, and, uh, and I found that where I am. I can do that. I can connect with people at, at every level and walk of life, you know. The average guy just going to work. So many people come make little detours to come and visit our shop every morning on their way to work. And um, that's important. That matters to me, man. That, that's making a difference in somebody's life, you know. Um, just somebody's having a rough day and they're, they're, they're having an off moment and maybe they're being rude or maybe they're just like spacey or whatever, you know. It's, it's important to remember that, that there's another person over there, you know. And, uh, and so this, is, this has become my venue for that. This has become my, I haven't had a raise in three years. I don't care. I mean, someday, you know, my bills are getting paid and all that kind of thing. And don't get me wrong, I'm not doing this because I, you know, don't ever want to have a raise again. But um, it feeds something in me that, you know, a regular job never fed. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's really important. Um, I, th I, th I think I've, <laughs> I think I've hit the end. So I, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and thank you so much for for paying attention to me. Now. I appreciate it. Thank you. I don't know what kind of time you have. Does anybody have any questions for Paul? I might have one, which yeah. is you, uh, you you started in Westbrook now, and I'm looking at Westbrook. Yeah. Why don't you tell us about that? So part of where we are with the shop right now is. Um, we're, we're kind of maxed out for space. Um, when we started, we, we did have some, some wholesale accounts that we started with, which were really important and kept us, you know, sort of working at times when things were slow. Um, but now we're, 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 we're squeezed for space and we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do next. And so one of the, one of the big things for us is how do, how do we grow? You know, and it's, it's I, I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> you know, I mean, I figured it would happen and, and I had some ideas, but I figured, ah, it's coming down the pike, it's coming down the pike. Um, but I'm here, we're here, Union Bagel is there. It's, you know, what do we do? How do we do that? And so now I'm at this point um, where, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this location in Westbrook. I, there's a lot of things that I like about this location in Westbrook. Um, and while the shop is doing well, there isn't a, a, a deep reserve of cash to just go venturing off into something. So I'm, I'm really trying to figure out how to make this happen. You know, how do I, how do I take what worked for getting one place started and getting an, and get another place started? What does that look like? Um, I'm in the process of figuring that out. Um, working the guy who owns the property is, excuse me, he's he's motivated for a lot of different reasons, but he also likes what I'm doing. Um, but he's also motivated because he wants to get this space occupied and and that kind of thing. So um, there's opportunities there for both of us to negotiate how that might work. Um, which, you know, is, is again a huge advantage. It's like if I can avoid, my company is not in debt. I have a small debt. Toby and I separated last, uh, separate, last September. Um, for the most part, amicably, um, you know, as any separation, no matter how, how well it goes, there are always moments of tension. But, but really, I feel like we handled it really well. And we just, it, it got to a point where it was just that time, you know. Um, he's a good man and he's, he's, he, Made, played a huge part in, in getting uh, Union Bagel started. So now I'm at this point where it's just me and, and um, you know, the company doesn't have any debt. Do we go into debt to grow or do we continue to try to do it the way we're, we're doing it? Um, and I'm trying to sort that out. So it's, it's a great question that I don't have an answer for and, and it often causes me anxiety and sometimes I have the answer and I'm like, yeah, let's go. And other times I'm like, yeah, I better not do that, it's gonna kill me. So, you know, the, the worst place to be, for myself anyway, is in that place of indecision, not making a commitment, whether it's a commitment to do it or a commitment to not do it. And by doing it, I mean, move, you know, move into an additional space. I don't wanna leave the space I'm in, I wanna keep the space I have. Um, but continue to grow, like how do we grow? So looking at a number of different things and, and trying to sort that out. And, you know, I'm, I'm working with, um, with SCORE and the, uh, the Small Business Administration and CEI, and I'm driving those poor people crazy. But, you know, they're, they're, they're incredible, man. There's so many resources out there that, where people just genuinely want to see you succeed. Um, and that's, uh, you know, I think that's true for all of us. I think we all really want to see our fellows succeed in one way or another. So, um, sort of a roundabout answer to your question. I don't have a definitive answer for you yet, sorry. How many different bagels do you make? Right now we have seven and cinnamon raisins. So the nice thing about uh, what I do is that I can take one bagel and make seven different kinds of bagels, 
without really having to change the recipe. It all comes down to toppings. So I got plain salt, sesame, you know, and we could do more toppings if we wanted to. Cinnamon raisin is, is a whole other mix. So I can take one mix, make seven different bagels, which is nice. And um, our most popular flavor is the uh, everything. <laughs> so we sell about three times of those more than anything else. So, uh, and we do bialis on the weekends, which have become more popular. So. Is there, I'm sorry, I can't see you. I thought, yeah. Um, so, the uh, bagel in Brooklyn that uh, made you feel better, uh, how does it rate against your bagel? Vice versa. I'm still aspiring to, you know, to that taste. It was this little place, there was, uh, there was a train station called Newkirk, Newkirk Plaza, and there was this little deli, and they, made deli, and they made bagels, and maybe I'll never reach that. Maybe it's one of those memories that's always in this, uh, in this perfect space that we have in our heads, but it's what I always aspire to. It was a sesame seed bagel, man. <laughs> sesame seed bagel and a can of Coke, and I was a happy camper on my worst day. So I still go there on occasionally, and, you know, um, it's close. It's close. So, all right. Well, again, thank you very much. I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it was very entertaining, and Paul has done a great job, and kind of navigating through life and to where he is now. Uh, we have uh, uh, another speaker coming up uh, in a month. That's going to be um, Skyler Kelly of Black Point Mercantile. And we'll be sending you information on that. So uh, we hope to see you back. And thank you again for coming to uh, Mechanics Hall. <laughs>